It seems like just last year that on-site batch plant mixers were all the rave, but this company has found a clever solution that may advance the industry a step further. I spent three weeks in Calgary watching this Nidus print and we got all kinds of great footage like using the printer for pick and place applications along with printer assembly and also insulation, bond beams and reinforcement placing in a level of detail we haven't seen before. We'll wait till the end for the big mixing development. I'm back at the Sisica Nation in Canada where Nidus 3D is working on the third quadplex. They've got two complete. The second one there was in the tent last time I was here they were printing. Now they've got the tent moved to the third unit. They should be able to print that in about six days. Then move on to the final unit. Hopefully we'll get to see all that happening, the printer moving. This is going to be an incredible experience because of all the innovations and improvements Nidus has made along the way. We'll be able to check out the progress from the first unit. They have the steel in already, some of the drywall, and some of the changes they made, not just only in the printing process, but also in the post print to finish out the rest of the home. So stick around for a really incredible video today. Let's get the boring part out of the way first. Printer assembly may not look fun, and that's right, it's not. It could take one to three days. Each of the six vertical columns rests on a two to four ton block and the calibration is extremely important. Your print will only be as precise as the printer itself. And unfortunately, printer assembly is a task that's far from automation. In the past, I've seen similar printers assembled with just a telehandler, but in this case, they have an enormous truck mounted boom doing all the heavy lifting. The team then guides it into place to ensure all three columns were lined up in parallel. At this point, you can really tell how important it is to get them in a perfect straight line. It's the beginning of a new print day. Yesterday they got all the window lentils up and we're up here with Gustavo who's preparing to get the print going. Gustavo, what are you working on? So now I'm just moving the printer to where it's going to start. So it starts smoothly and I'm just going to just extrusion when it starts going really slowly at the beginning and then when we're good we're just running. Is there anything special you gotta look out for in the first layer? Yeah the height just gotta make sure we have the 40 mil height layer and the alignment with the previous day's print. All right well good yeah. luck. Yeah thanks. This first layer is really sensitive especially over that lentil sticking up they need to make sure they don't knock into it as it's epoxied into the concrete wall from yesterday. The concrete is so sticky that even though it overhangs over the lintel a little bit, it sticks to itself. It's not even falling off and it's uh, doing a great job concealing that lintel, making it for something I believe is an architectural masterpiece showcasing the raw construction method. Gustavo, are you happy with how this first layer is going? Yeah, it's looking nice. It's a little bit stiffer. This is what we want now because it's kind of overhanging on the lintel, so it's looking pretty great. Is and we're going any? with full speed now. so. This is supposed to be 25 yeah. millimeters a second? Yeah, 250 millimeters a second. All right, that's great. And uh, so you have eight layers to do today? Yeah, eight layers, exactly. Terrific. People like to comment, why is there no rebar in a 3D printed house? But you can see right there, Paige is putting in the horizontal reinforcement, which is going to give the wall structural integrity between the inner and outer layers. Hey Paige, what's going on right now? Uh, right now we're lifting the lentil windows onto over top of the windows, the doors, and the other side windows. Uh, we're using the printer right now instead of getting a crane in here. It, uh, it's more than capable of lifting the weight, 370 pounds I think this is. Yeah, something like that. So yeah, we're just doing lentils today and then hopefully tomorrow we'll finish off the print with eight layers. Awesome. It's great to see you getting such versatile use out of the printer. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, multitasking for sure. <laughs> Steel lintels can often flex when spanning over a large area, so they're supported just with a simple 2x4. Then Nidus will print over this. This is the first time we've seen insulation installed on this channel, and it's also the first example of expanding spray foam that I've seen. Most groups would use some kind of loose fill, but in this case, the expanding spray foam is all right in the cavity between the inner and outer wall. All of the vertical columns for this building are only attached to the interior wall with no connection to the exterior wall. This allows for continuous insulation around the entire building and minimizes cold bridging. Even when the printing is done, there's still concrete left to be poured. 
in this case they have a bond beam going along the entire perimeter of the top of the building around the top foot or so you can see the walls on the inside have received spray foam insulation and the printer itself is being used to deposit regular concrete which is a different mix than printable concrete into this bond beam which already has a rebar cage installed throughout the entire thing especially in windy regions like Sisica Nation in Calgary it's critical to have a really strong bond from your roof truss system to the building itself now on to the big mixing development initially Nidus was using a batch plant mixer because all the materials they needed were locally available and they figured mixing on site could be an advantage it did come with lots of extra labor and this step was quite intensive they came up with a new solution using a traditional old concrete truck and material mixed at a batch plant mixer about an hour away the material is then dumped from the truck into a pump so that it can be precisely fed into the printer during the printing process it's a much slower release of the concrete from the truck than they are typically used to often these trucks would only be on site for maybe an hour at a time but in this case you need the truck on site throughout the print day perhaps there's some type of silo or other advancement which could temporarily hold the concrete and reduce the need of the truck to be on site for the duration with such unique parameters and requirements I would imagine that when the 3D printed construction industry gets big enough it would make sense to build out a custom truck that has more precise control over the flow rate and perhaps even a pump that could accommodate printing through a 100 foot long hose. Hey guys, so we're back here at Seek Seeka First Nation. Uh, so this is the first building that you guys have already seen. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've made a lot of progress on it. Um, roof is fully finished at this point and uh, we've been working on the interior finishes and it's going really smooth. So come on in. So now you get an idea for how the space is gonna be the four units, this is one of them. Absolutely, yeah. So each unit is about 550 square feet. It's one bed, one bath. Um, so See all the electrical, the plumbing going through the walls? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So kind of how we tried to uh, design everything out here was that all the MEP went down the, uh, down the cross walls for all the units. And um, it's actually been going super well because we've allowed for enough space in between. This, uh, it's going to make for a great fireproof wall as well as uh, soundproofing. Um, what else? So we also have uh, these doors at 38 inches uh, in order for the wheelchair accessibility for these units. And so we see this is a relatively large bathroom for, uh, you know, standard sizes of bathrooms. And that is for that wheelchair accessibility portion. So next up, we passed all the inspections and next up now the drywallers are coming back in later this afternoon and they should be done within a couple days, mudding, taping, painting, and then all the remainder of the exterior finishes. So, Is there anything you learned from this one that you'll do differently on the next in terms of after the print's done, the framing? Absolutely, yeah. So we've already started that on the second building is just kind of like sequencing different events. So uh, for example, on this one, we did steel studs first on the uh, and it kind of just made for a little bit more choppy um, and more time consuming drywalling with all the cuts. So on this second one over there, uh, we've now done the drywall first and then steel studs going in after. So yeah. You really get a good idea for how they do most of the plumbing and electrical. This building has steel framing all throughout the inside and this makes all of that stuff really accessible. Even though some of it does go through the printed wall, you can see where it comes out right there through the bottom. Uh, and all of the electrical and plumbing, or at least the water lines, go four feet underground all the way to the well. Because it gets so cold here, that's a requirement. Let's go up this ladder and see what the attic looks like. It's uh, definitely going to be dark up there, but the top up is framed traditionally with uh, roof trusses and two by fours. So the attic space looks pretty typical compared to a normal attic in a regular house. From up here, you can barely tell it's a printed building, but you have all of the ceiling lights and stuff. So this is really coming together nicely. And this is the first one they did. So I'm sure on the second iteration, third and fourth, it'll only get easier from here. All right, so now you see behind us, this is the second building. So 
from everything we learned on the first building, uh, this building took us about five and a half days to complete business days. And now uh, last Wednesday, um, we had just finished printing this. So the roof, windows, doors, everyone was pretty much had learned everything that they needed to on the first building. And now we're just flying. So we're currently printing the third building uh, as we speak. And uh, that one we're set to finish in about four, four and a half days until we're tearing down the tent and putting the roof back up. So kind of, as I was saying earlier, now we're doing the drywall first and it just full sheets up and uh, it allows it to go a lot smoother. This is about a day and a half's worth of work and the guys are just taking lunch right now and then should be done this afternoon and then steel studs start tomorrow. So it should be, uh, should be pretty good. And then pretty much excited to see what we learn on this one to take it to the next interior finish on the third building and uh, hopefully for a lot more in the future. This was my second to last day on this construction site. They almost had the tent fully assembled. By the next day, they had the tent ready and had begun printing the first layers of the fourth building. I conducted a podcast episode with their CEO, Ian Arthur, available on the Automate Construction podcast, where we walked through the fourth and final build along with the earlier buildings and discussed Ian's plans, the challenges they faced along the way, and what's in store for the future of Nidus 3D. Huge shout out to the Nidus team for being open and transparent in allowing me to share their work with the world. Not every company is so willing to bear their hard work in the public eye. Some would be more secretive, but I truly see a strong pattern of the most transparent companies also being the most productive. If you'd like to continue seeing the most cutting edge construction tech projects from around the world, make sure to like and subscribe so that I can continue bringing them to you.